Hi everybody, uh, it's a real treat to be presenting at Oxford this year. Uh, we thought it wasn't going to happen, but we made it. Uh, a fully online and COVID secure digital extravaganza and hopefully events like tonight are able to bring people together who might not know each other uh, to talk about things that you might not necessarily spoken about uh, otherwise. So a very big welcome from me. We have Janice Kanori with us today, who is a research associate with CARE, which is the Historic Environment Image Resource. Um, and she's going to be telling us about the photographic images that are depicting Oxford right through from the 19th, 20th, and even into the 21st century. Now introduce Janice Kanori, who will tell us about Oxford then and now. Good evening and welcome to this virtual event. I was looking in the Oxford Times today and I realized there's a really nice story about the festival and they talked about all the new technologies that are gonna be showcased in the next month. And you might wonder why therefore that an I uh, uh, talk about the past is part of the festival. Well, I'm also talking about state-of-the-art technology. It's just that it's the 19th century state-of-the-art technology that we'll really be showcasing tonight. The pictures that you're gonna be seeing were digitized by the AIR project. And as Kathy so rightly said, AIR stands for the Historic Environment Image Resource. AIR is based at Oxford's Institute of Archeology, span but includes images from a large number of university departments. Initial funding for our project was provided by the Riva and David Logan Foundation, and our ongoing funding is through a private donor and the university itself. With the commercial out of the way, let me go forward. I want to talk a little bit about the background before I do talk about Oxford. The AIR project actually started as a housekeeping exercise at the Institute of Archaeology after 50 years in the building, every covered cabinet and space under desk and on top of file cabinets was full. We went through all of the material and discovered both a huge paper archive left behind by the people who had preceded us. But for tonight's purpose, we're going to talk about the other bit we found, which is photographs. The photographs were in the form of lantern slides, glass negatives, film negatives, plate negatives, and they were stored in boxes and bags and suitcases and just about anything uh, you can imagine. So it's taken us years to sort things out, eight years in fact. Now the AIR Digital Image Archive gives the world access to hidden, largely forgotten views from the archives of multiple university departments. The collection includes scenes dating from the 1860s to the recent past, primarily sites in Europe, North America, and the former British Empire. The images are held in a searchable database that can be accessed from your own home computer. And I'll tell you how to do that later in the presentation. I wanna talk about the technology behind the original images that we're going to look at. The majority of the pictures you'll see tonight were taken from lantern slides. Others will have come from glass plate negatives, film negatives, photographs, 35 millimeter slides, or digital images. Now, this particular picture shows the same lantern slide under different lighting conditions. And you might recognize it as the Alfred Jewell from the Ashmolean Museum. Lantern slides developed as early as 1849, a decade after the start of modern photography. They are made by bonding a light sensitive solution to a glass surface to create a type of negative. And then that is printed onto a second piece of glass. After printing, the image was hand colored as in this case, or left black and white. The dyes were that are used seem to be a very high grade, but probably contain many chemicals that would be prohibited now. The image was then matted as you can see in the upper left and a glass cover was put on. Now the upper image itself is a view of the complete lantern slide as an object as we found it in the archive at the Institute of Archaeology. You can see a label telling us that the lantern slide was sold by the studio of the famous Oxford photographer, Henry Tomp, who died in 1922, and the picture may have been taken by him. 
the gold trim on the slide, as well as its hand coloring tell us it was originally quite expensive. The lower picture shows what it looks like when you actually project it. Now we shared these scans with the Ashmolean Museum, who didn't have a record of these pictures, making this old image a very valuable addition to their modern archive. Although developed initially for entertainment, land and slides quickly became an educational tool. Institutions purchased projectors such as this monstrous one. Most lantern slides were produced in a standard size of three and a half by four inches from their initial production all the way to the point of obsolescence in the 1950s and 60s. That meant that the same slides worked in these much later, uh, much more svelte looking projectors. This happens to be one that belongs to the air project. Now, because the format didn't change, from the day that the university started buying slides, even if they only bought 10 or 20 a year starting in 1870, if they kept it up till 1950 or 1960, the collections that developed were huge. Now, storing all these lantern slides became a problem because they're heavy, they're very fragile, they require a great deal of storage space, and they did need these cumbersome projectors. And that means that many of the collections that once existed within the university have already ended up in skips. Now there are still a handful of projectors around, but we can't turn them on. The electrics look quite dodgy, and even if we could rewire them, there are no replacement bulbs anymore. So these slides have not been seen at the very least for 50 years or more before we started digitizing them. AIR now contains images from the School of Archaeology, the Ashmolean Museum, the Departments of the History of Art, Geography, Plant Science, Zoology, Harris Manchester College, and St. Hughes College, as well as those from private donors. Our early focus was on landscape images, but now we're adding artifacts, maps, and drawings as well. Often with our pictures, we find ourselves rediscovering what was once common knowledge. I'm pretty confident that most of you have been to Stonehenge. Now we found this shocking picture of Stonehenge with several stones barely held upright with wooden props. It was only when we took time for research that we found that a number of the stones had been straightened and secured, first in 1895, again in 1901, and later during the 1950s and 60s. Some of you may even remember that last set of straightenings. But in a typical audience when I give this talk, most people will not know this has ever happened. The Stonehenge we visit, which seems so permanent today, has been manipulated repeatedly, not merely in the distant past, but even within living memory. As individuals working with these images, we could not help but be struck by the impermanence of what seems permanent all around us and how rapidly our collective memory of events fades. Keep this in mind as you see the views of Oxford that I'll get to shortly. On the theme of rediscovering what was once common knowledge, some of you will probably have visited Venice. However, I suspect few of you know that the Campanile collapsed on the 14th of July, 1902, and the modern structure is actually a 20th century recreation of the original. It's safe to say that the picture was taken not too long after that date. Uh, by the way, there is a fake photo circulating on the internet that purports to show the actual moment of the collapse of the tower. So fake news is not new. In the era of digital cameras and phone cameras, it's hard to remember that photography was once a vocation that required hauling heavy, delicate instruments about, followed by hard work with a variety of dangerous chemicals in dark rooms, and finding out only long after you left the site whether any worthwhile images had been produced. This time delay means that some of the images in our collection are of relatively poor quality. At the time though, they may have been the only available picture, so the lantern slide was created despite the obvious flaws of the image. Photography was not a common hobby for the middle class until after the advent of the Brownie camera in 1900, and the high cost of printing images still limited its widespread uptake long after that date. What you're going to see tonight are a minute sample of the more than 32,000 diverse images in our database. Now we start uh, talking about Oxford, a historic city that has a long track record of being rather casual about its built heritage. 
So casual, in fact, that not all of Oxford's built heritage is still in Oxford. This is the elaborate upper structure that was once part of the Carfax conduit. This system replaced the 13th century city water system. It provided the city with water from 1617 until the 19th century. Now the conduit ran in an underground lead pipe from a spring on the hillside above the village of North Hingsea, beneath the Seacourt stream and the River Thames to a building in Carfax, which was topped by this structure, all paid for by a London lawyer hoping to impress James I. By 1787, the structure had become an obstacle to traffic and it was removed and replaced with a smaller cistern. This part of it is 40 feet tall. It has eight niches containing statues of historic and mythical figures. The original structure was given to the Earl Harcourt who had it rebuilt on the grounds of his home, Nunham House, at Nunham Courtney, where it still stands. If you look closely, you'll note a number of subtle differences between the pictures, such as the replaced statues near the top, the missing spears in the lower corner beast paws, and the plaque. Now, there are many challenges to working with old images. We debated cleaning at the start of the project, as in our jargon, the accumulated dirt was part of each object's biography. But ultimately, we decided we had to get the dirt off. Now we quickly learned that not all of the accumulated dirt can be removed without harming the slide. So you might note that not every picture presented here is pristine. Some of our images, like this one on the left, also show signs of deterioration resulting from the conditions associated with their original manufacture, where the dust was trapped between the two glass plates, now creating spots in the sky. Now, there have been some very unexpected changes over time revealed in our pictures. For instance, take a good look at the shop fronts on the right side of the 19th century view of Corn Market Street, which have somewhat amazingly become more Tudor in the past century or so. This is not something that many of our tour guides rushed to point out pre-COVID to our many visitors. But if you look closely at the upper stories the next time you're in town, you might spot the tiny plaque that mentions the 1988 restoration of the building. Now you can see while, that while the roof line of the restored section is similar to the 1799 drawing, it, which shows the northwest corner of the building, the Tudor style bare timbers are nowhere to be seen at even that date. You can also see in the old picture the reason that the church on Corn Market is called St. Michael at the North Gate because it's still physically attached at that point. Another difference between the 19th and 21st century pictures are the tram tracks seen in the earlier view and the fact that private vehicles were then permitted on Corn Market. We have no choice now but to walk the length of the street or wait for out of business hours when we, a bicycle can be used. Bannon slides were used as lecture illustrations, not only at the university, but they also fed a growing appetite for learning about the world among the middle and working classes. Bannon slide sets could be purchased with complete scripted lectures, though there's no evidence in our collection that the university dons were using those prepared scripts. In an era when travel was largely restricted to the wealthy and visits to Oxford were rare, Lantern slide images were effective tools for expanding the experience of places to those for whom travel was too costly and difficult. To understand how restricted travel was in the recent past, consider this extremely small number of people in this 1908 image of a familiar landmark, the Martyrs Memorial, located at the south end of St. Giles. And compare that to the pre-coronavirus tourists in this photo. I'd like to draw your attention to the isolating metal railing around the memorial in the first picture. This was part of the original memorial designed by George Gilbert Scott. The memorial was funded by public subscription campaign in 1841 and completed in 1843. It commemorates the executions by burning of bishops Hugh Latimer and Nicholas Ridley in 1555 and the former Archbishop of Canterbury, Thomas Cranmer in 1556 
for refusing to renounce their Protestant beliefs during the reign of Queen Mary I. The fence served to keep viewers far enough back so one could view the statues and contemplate the sacrifice of men willing to die for their faith. The fence was there until World War II when it was removed as part of a wartime scrap metal drive. The image has now changed over time from being a monument where one was to contemplate religious martyrdom at a distance to a place that's easy to locate, to meet friends, a place to sit for a while, or to build snowmen, or it's just a tour stop, a complete change since it was built. Both continuity and change are key themes in the history of the city. One unfortunate point of continuity seems to be a theme of questionable planning decisions. Let's consider one of these now. Have you ever actually taken a moment to think about the 13th century Carfax Tower sitting in its isolated majesty on Queen Street? This is how it looked in context beside the second St. Martin's Church. The first church of this name dated from the 12th century and stood there until 1820 when it was deemed unsafe and demolished except for the tower. It was replaced with a lovely church which opened in June of 1822. A mere 74 years later in 1896, what had been the city church since medieval times was torn down when it was decided that it needed to be removed to allow for more vehicular traffic. It would appear that removing the Carfax conduit in 1787 did not permanently solve the traffic problem. To finish the story of the city church, I'll tell you a bit more. This grade one listed building is located at the intersection of the High Street and Churl Street to the east of the last picture, and it was known as All Saints Church. It took over as the official city church and continued in that capacity until it too was decommissioned in 1971. It's also a relatively modern replacement for a 12th century building completed in 1720. It now serves as the Lincoln College Library. Since 1971, St. Michael at the North Gate on Corn Market Street has been the official city church. This group of lantern slides would suggest that the city was once in the forefront of public transportation. As proof, we offer these images of parts of the tram systems which once served Oxford. Starting in the lower left, we have a view of the first horse tram system which connected the railway station with Collie Road via Carfax starting in 1881. Part of the route ran along the high street and is shown here on the Maudlin Bridge. The two pictures in the top row are views of the second line which connected Carfax to Rackham's Lane, which is now called St. Margaret's Road via Corn Market, Maudlin and St. Giles Streets beginning in 1882. Both of these horse-drawn tram lines ran until 1914 when they were replaced by motorized buses. In the lower right corner, you can see tram tracks at the junction of Beaumont and Worcester Streets in front of Worcester College, curving to head north through Jericho to Kingston Road and Norham Manor. Having opened in 1884, this tram line stayed in use until World War II. The men and women of Oxford were also early adopters of bicycles, as shown in this 1908 picture of Maudlin Bridge still a favored transport mode here in Oxford. Affordable housing in Oxford is another ongoing topic of conversation in our city. We wonder now with 2020 hindsight, if the destruction of housing in central Oxford rather than its rehabilitation was truly the best way forward. This image shows the now lost gas street leading to the former St. Ebbs Gas Works, all of which vanished in the mid 20th century. At least from the outside, these homes appear similar to the ones standing in Jericho, most now valued in the high six figures. To be fair, not all of the housing that was destroyed would have been easy to save. These slum dwellings in Ayers Yard with their outdoor water supply, which once stood near Gas Street in central Oxford, were probably beyond any possible refurbishment. When you mention water in Oxford, that leads to a popular subject in our collection, images of Oxford floods. 
This is one of our oldest images, a view of the 1875 flood in front of the Great Western Railway Station and beneath the rail bridge. An intriguing aspect of this image, as well as almost all of our other flood pictures, is the absence of women and girls among the bystanders. Given the topography of the city, floods have been a repeated problem. These are pictures from a 19th century flood on the Abingdon Road. The houses are still standing, now with others built in a known floodplain, and Ebbingen Road still floods periodically. This is a, a picture of the 1894 flood in St. Thomas Street in central Oxford. This is the flooded Botley Road in November 19, or excuse me, November 1898, with young men having a good time in the water. In the 20th century, technology changes, and we add an aerial view of the 1929 flood to our group of flood pictures, providing a broader view of the situation in the Thames Valley, which is followed by another aerial photograph, this one showing Botley Road generally above the great 1947 flood. This is a second view of the 1947 flood, which shows how the university buildings sit on higher ground in the central city, protecting them from the periodic flooding that affects the city. It really demonstrates the value of arriving in the area 800 years before your neighbors. I'll close the section with this modern image borrowed from the internet showing conditions on Osney Island in July 2007. The picture illustrates undesirable continuity in the city. It also, finally, shows a woman engaging with the floodwaters. Hopefully the planned flood relief channel will make this type of Oxford picture a rarity in the future. For the sake of balance, I want to mention that we also get to enjoy the water that's so much a part of our lives here. This lovely lantern slide image was labeled after the eights in 1902. For those not familiar with Oxford speak, the eights are annual rowing races on a part of the Thames known as the Isis between teams from colleges of the university. Now we still enjoyed this tradition, although pre-COVID, uh, but with a lot less elegance and a lot more attention to health and safety. Now it's often said that there are iconic views in Oxford. These four views of Christ Church College Tom Tower on St. Aldate's came from three different departments, the Department of History of Art, Harris Manchester College, and St. Hugh's College. The two on the left and the, the one in the center all come from the era before cars even existed, while the right-hand one was taken in the 1920s. If you note the growth of the tree, you can see the center image is the earliest one. Yet despite the passage of time, four photographers stood in the exact same location and took the same picture. Continuity and change indeed of an iconic view. Now I'd like to take you on a virtual tour of the city. We're going to start near the west end of the high street, which is one of our famous townscapes, containing some of the most famous views of Oxford, which many people think are unchanging. Now there were still many medieval buildings standing in the late 19th century on the high and elsewhere in the city. This is a view of Brasenose College before its now familiar high street frontage was built in the 1887-1889 period. You may be more familiar with this view, which I took from the internet. We stroll past Brasenose and we come to the University Church of St. Mary the Virgin. I'd like you to take a close look at the ornate Nicholas Stone design Baroque porch built in 1637 with the famous 13th century tower in the background. Here's another view of it. This one is also a 19th century view. This later hand colored view suggests a shift in either gardening skills or taste as ivy has been allowed to grow extensively along the south side of the building, obscuring much of the fine stonework of the porch. The small shrubs at the western end of the building have now become large enough to block some of the light, which had previously reached the adjacent stained glass window. 
Although neither of these images had any data on them, by reviewing details such as the ones I've mentioned, it's still possible for us to determine which of these images is the older one. This is a relative dating technique we use quite often in our work. This view of the church shows that ivy is now absent, but the lovely porch was again obscured from the, viewed from the west, this time by an almond tree. Sadly, the tree was damaged by the prolonged drought of 2018 and was cut down at the start of 2019. Although a replacement was planted, it will take decades before it again looks anything like this. Across the virtual high street from the church, we can see the much discussed front of the grade two star listed Rhodes Building at Oriel College with its now infamous statue of Cecil Rhodes. I must confess until the demonstrations began, I had never noticed the statue. This lantern slide was entitled New Front Oriel College, taken about 1911. With the horse tram tracks still in place, it can't be later than 1914. Moving onwards, east, towards the east, we pass All Souls College. You may have noticed there's a crack running across this picture. We digitized as many lantern slides and glass plate negatives as possible, even if they were damaged, as there are many pictures that cannot be replaced. Should a perfect image be required, we find it's usually possible to Photoshop out the damage. Not every change in Oxford is on a major scale. In this case, the old image shows now vanished masonry details above and below the bay windows, which you don't find in our modern image. Queen's College is our next landmark. This lovely image has several surprises, including the walking sign man in the middle of the road and a woman on her bicycle accompanied by her dog. This is one of a number of images in air showing Victorian or Edwardian women riding on bicycles. Bicycles provided women affordable access to personal transportation and a degree of personal freedom not previously available to them. This change was not without controversy with strong objections being raised to the very idea of women using bicycles and their riding apparel. This is the same scene now. You may notice this view is slightly different than the earlier one. Our oldest cameras were made to imperial measurements. Our modern ones are all metric, so you can't quite align the photos in the same way. The former handsome cab parking area has been replaced by a bus stop. The no parking zone uh, is present now, and the light colored billing stone has been cleaned of its earlier layer of grime. As we continue virtually eastwards, we glance across the street and admire the examination schools building, a grade two listed structure. I always think of this structure as the site of untold human misery from all the students who took exams there. The building was completed in 1882, so we can define the earliest possible date of this image, though not its actual date. The abundance of horse manure on the high street, however, would suggest a pre-World War I date. Although the high street roadway has changed greatly, it, as with Queen College, the building frontage is virtually unchanged, except for the flagpole above the main entrance uh, since the first picture was taken. As we continue the virtual stroll on the high street, we approach Maudlin College, here viewed on a sunny day from a point near Longwall Street. Finally, we stroll past that college onto Maudlin Bridge and look back towards town in another of the oldest images in the archive. The bridge shown here is the way it looked between the years 1778 and 1882, when it had a width of only 27 feet which accommodated a single roadway and the two pavements. But even this was not the first stone bridge across the Charwell River, as this one replaced the 16th century stone bridge that had been lost to a flood. We complete our journey along the high street, looking back now along the bridge that was widened in 1882 to accommodate the new trams. The, the increasing traffic from expanding suburbs of the East Oxford also demanded more space. 
The bridge is seen on a sunny day in a view scan from a colored lantern slide, one of the latest ones in air. By the early 1960s, lantern slides were being replaced by 35 millimeter slides that were smaller, less expensive, and didn't break. Having completed our journey up the high street, I want to head back towards Broad Street by following Long Hall Street up from the high towards Holywell Street. This route will take us past the grade two listed site of the original Morris Cycle Works, then housed in a converted livery stable on 21 Long Wall. Now changed beyond all recognition from our picture with the frontage of its last phase as an industrial building retained, but now actually housing students from New College. Now, I thought it might be fun to start our time in Broad Street with this view of the medieval buildings lost to the construction of the new Bodleian Library begun in 1936 and completed in 1940. This picture was probably taken from the cupola of the Sheldonian Theater on the opposite side of Broad Street. Now the new Bodleian Library building was always beset with problems of various types and was rebuilt as the Weston Library, which opened in 2015. Although there are echoes of the new Bodleian structure, there's no link whatsoever with the medieval past. Those medieval buildings looked out on the vista shown in this view of the Clarendon Building and the Sheldonian Theater and a much calmer Broad Street. At the far end of the image where Cat Street and Broad Street intersect, you can see that the Cat Street frontage of the present Oxford Martin School, formerly known as the Indian Institute Building, is missing. The part of the site in this picture contains house shops that were known as 31, 32, and 33 Broad Street, which were under long-term leases until 1892, after which the Indian Institute building was expanded onto this land. So we know this picture cannot be later than that date, as the expansion was completed by 1896. Speaking of the Clarendon building, this is another Henry Taunt picture, this one showing the 1899 excavation by the Oxford Architectural and Historical Society of the Clarendon Quadrangle. The exposed stonework was part of the former city wall. In this late 19th century view of the Clarendon building, the Sheldonian Theater and the old Ashmolean building, now the Museum of Science, you have an excellent view of 11 of the 17 heads of the emperors on the courtyard fence. Initially, there were only 13 heads, which were created as part of the Sheldonian Theater construction project completed in 1668. Four more heads were installed when the old Ashmolean building was finished in 1683. All 17 were replaced in 1868, probably not too long before this picture was taken, as the heads are very clean and fresh looking. This set of heads suffered from an unfortunately harsh cleaning after a student prank that involved painting the heads, which resulted in the rapid deterioration of these sculptures. All were replaced between 1970 and 72, with the images being modeled on an early painting of Broad Street. Our images of the Broad Street emperors have been used extensively during recent research by the Bodleian Library into these sculptures. We now have a, a good view of the old Ashmolean Museum building, which has been the Museum of the History of Science since 1924. This is the world's oldest surviving purpose-built museum building. It actually looks much the same despite major changes to the entrance since this original picture was taken. If we move westwards on Broad Street, Exeter College comes into view on the south side of the roadway. It looks much more peaceful without a parking lot at its front door. This viewpoint is shared with the Anthony Gormley sculpture, which now stands on the roof of Exeter College. This hand-colored image gives an excellent view of the west end of Broad Street and Balliol College. Now the background here is particularly important. We know the Randolph Hotel opened in 1866. The Gothic front of Balliol College was installed between 1866 and 67. And the Elliston and Cavell Old Store, now our Debenhams, was demolished in 1894. 
So we know that this is after 1867, but before 1894. We're going to finish our visual tour of Broad Street with a closer view of the neo-Gothic front of the Brackenberry buildings at Balliol College. As I said, they were built between 1867 and 68, and also the adjoining Master's Lodge, which is grade two listed, was built at the same time. The main entrance to the college is through the central gate tower. This actually shows more cars than you see in a modern view and fewer bicycles than in the modern view. Having finished our walking tour, there's one final change in Oxford I want to mention because it's exactly a century since it happened. From its earliest beginnings in the 11th century to until 1920, all of the matriculated students at Oxford were men. This early view of students at one of the entrances to New College would have been a typical 19th century group of lads. The women in the lower picture were one of the very first matriculated classes from St. Hugh's College. They may have been some of the first women to ever take examinations in the spring of 1921. Including St. Hugh's, Oxford once had four women's colleges, the others being Lady Margaret Hall, St. Hilda's, and Somerville, though all are now co-educational. If our quick stroll along the virtual streets of Oxford has left you a bit weary and needing to relax, like our cyclists who visited the Devil's Quoits in their original location at Stanton Harcourt, which is part of a story for another day, I fear, you may be pleased that we've almost come to the end of this talk. I hope by now that you eagerly want to know how to access the images yourself. You start by logging into the AIR Project website. No password is needed if you use the, the site. I'll repeat the URL, uh, the address, which is shown at the top of the page on my last slide. Once you're on the home page, start by typing in your search terms. I would suggest using place names or classes of objects or people, such as bicycle or animal or children. For Oxford city images, use the phrase Oxford, Oxfordshire, and a street name if you know it to narrow down the search even more. If you leave out Oxfordshire, your search will be almost the whole collection as the name of the university appears on all of our images. These are results for a search of Broad Street in Oxford. The results appear as an array of relevant images. If you right click on an individual image, you go to a more detailed screen. You can see, the re <coughs> pardon me, the re search results include a modern re-photograph. We always need more of these, and I'll mention them, how you can send them to us at the end of the talk. If you right click on an image, this is an example of the information seen you're going to be seeing. The image shows all the main text fields, plus a map, related images, and where the red arrow points, a more, even a more information tab. Not every image has the same amount of information. It, most will sadly not yet have maps, and only a handful have related images. Do use your right scroll bar and look all the way down the page to ensure you've seen all the information available about your picture. A related image will include modern reef photographs sometimes, similar old images or alternate exposures of the given image. Now from this individual image detail screen, you can download low resolution images freely by clicking on either of the download boxes shown with where the blue arrow is pointing. If you needed higher resolution images, you can contact the AIR project directly using the e our email address that I'll be showing at the end of the presentation. If you use our images in a presentation or publication, please indicate that they're being used with the permission of the department or person shown as the holder of the image. And we'd love to hear from you to know that you've used them. Rephotographs are an important part of increasing the knowledge base in the AIR project digital image archive. Similar to the Weston Library images I showed earlier, the Whitney Congregational Church is long gone and it's not noted in the new structures that replaced it. 
This is certainly a lost Vista image. We're always looking for more re-photographs to add to air. If you're inspired to match any for us, please send them to the email address at the end. I want to thank you for listening and joining us at this virtual event. I hope you've enjoyed the selection of Oxford images I've shared tonight. There are so many stories that I could tell you with our other images, but they'll have to wait for another evening. Here again is the URL for AIR and our email address. You can also see more of our images on a reg in our regular posts on Facebook and Twitter, and you can learn more about our work and our research in our blogs. I'd be happy to answer questions about our project if Kathy has any help now, or if you're a bit shy, you can always send them to us by the e email address. Thank you very much for having us. Thank you, Janice, for such uh, a fascinating talk. What fascinated me actually was looking at how the the college buildings are sort of raised up above the the sort of floodplain below, and the fact that Oxford has flooded for many many years. And I guess that's how the the city got its name that it was the the ford where the oxen crossed the Thames. Yeah. Um, and I guess with um, climate change uh, as it is now going, flooding may become more and more of an issue. Um, but uh, how, how many sort of years worth of images do, do you have that, that show flooding in Oxford? Well, as I said, our earliest flood image that we've been able to pin down is 1875. And we have images going through 1947. Uh, and we know there have been floods since 1947, so. Yeah, and more and more frequently, I, I imagine. Yeah. So I'd be quite interested in knowing, if I may, um, what are the things that have surprised you most over the few years that the AIR project has been produced? I really like the small details, for instance, when buildings have been ever so slightly modified, almost imperceptibly modified. I just wondered if there's been any surprises that you've come across, Janice, that um, the, almost like the road statue that you said you never even you know, you just walk past these all the time. You know, and yeah, I mean, that, that's certainly typical in Oxford. You walk past a building and it looks old and, and because so much is built in neo-Gothic style, you sort of assume it's older than it is. Um, I'd say St. Martin's Church uh, was one of our real shocks because uh, we, we, we recognized the corner, the intersection, but we none of us had seen the building and of course it, it went before the the end of the 19th century but the idea that they would spend the money build a church and then tear it down 74 years later uh, was quite shocking yeah i mean it's a big investment in resource the money and the space <laughs> well also that and the fact that saint martin's church was the city church it had been there since the 12th century so it was you know, quite important in the life of the city. Um, so I imagine if I if I read the letters to the editor of the Oxford Times and the Oxford Mail, there'd be a lot of lively discussion going on. Looks like there's some questions now. Kathy. Yeah, we, we have a question from Jill. Um, thank you for the talk. Interesting to see the historic photos of Brazenose College on the High Street. What do we know about the buildings that were there in the photo that you shared? Um, they were house shops and they were medieval. Uh, I don't actually have a date for them, but many, many buildings uh, up to the 19th century in Oxford had medieval uh, roots, if you will. Uh, when at the building on Corn Market, I, I failed to mention uh, the one that looks more Tudor now than it did. Uh, that actually is a Tudor building that had been modified by generations of people to be up to date and look fashionable. And it was a, an architectural decision in, in 1988 to take it back to a cod uh, medieval look uh, in line with the, the interior. Uh, if you go, I, I assume Pret-a-Manger is still open. I'm hoping it is. 
if you go in there uh, and look up, you'll see original medieval beams and, and other building structures. So it, it, the frontage is not truly medieval, but it's not a complete fraud being at that location uh, on that building. Thank you for that, Janice. Um, we've just been asked if we can share the, uh, the website again, or could we perhaps just go back to your final slide? Yeah, no problem. So that people I'll, I'll can go see to that. screen. And um, Anne Lynn has asked, could you show us where to find the date and year of the photographs on the um, yeah, website. Okay, well, let me let me do two things then. Um, let me get the slideshow up. Okay, that's not good. I'm going to stop share for a second and then go back. All right. All right, it appears I cannot share here without going to the beginning and then clicking through. So we, we didn't practice this one, folks. <laughs> but it was the location of how do you, how do you get the date? Yeah, I wanted to start on the slide um, that, that would have made that quickest to answer. Drat. Yeah, I for some reason can it does not click, want to share. Back, can you click your back button? No, okay. Okay. Yeah. It it asks me if I want to um, share. And if I do share right now, I am getting a black screen, which I cannot explain. You are screen sharing. Yes. It can you can you press the back arrow to try and go back a page? Will it let you do that? Yeah. No. no. Right. Well, I can answer some questions. Uh, look by sight. First of all, the 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 URL that you want to type in, folks is http colon slash slash air h e i r full stop a r c h full stop that stands for archaeology o x for oxford full stop a c full stop u k when you're on the information screen uh, for a particular image there, when you look at the middle of that screen, you'll find a field that shows you um, images from, uh, not images, but text. Any text we have about the image would be in the field called caption. If it appears in quotation marks, we took that right off the object. Um, what I might do, Dane and Kathy, if, if I'm going to try to screen share, but I'm going to open my screen and actually open air and see if I can that would be uh, great. share yeah. that instead of the presentation. So okay. folks, we haven't practiced this. We'll see how it works. Okay, what, while you're doing that, Janice, if you're able to multitask, yeah, uh, we've had another question asking what has happened to the old slides. The old lantern slides that we've scanned, uh, if they belong to the university, are with the department that owns them. Um, 
and they are in the possession. So all the Institute of Archaeology slides are at the Institute of Archaeology. The geography, zoology, and plant science collections have been sent to uh, storage at the Swindon site. Are you guys picking this up? You need to be sharing your screen yeah, again, I think. Yeah. Okay. Um, let me see if I can zoom. All right. Screen share. Right. What have you got now? Okay. So we can see your 11 results. Excellent. Um, okay. And some photographs with highlighted text on them. All right. So I searched for Oxford, Oxfordshire Broad, Broad, I didn't use the word street. And I'm going to go to this lovely color image. And you can see the image here. You can see the boxes I talked about. You can see, you can download for power, a PowerPoint version or a web version if you want to put it on Facebook. And here is my information field. And right here is the caption, HMC. It came from Harris Manchester College. England, Oxford, View of Broad Street. And it was number nine in, in their ordering system. The keywords you could find, we currently have uh, HMC, which is for the Harris Manchester collection. It's was made of glass rather than film. It was a lantern slide. It's a color image. There's a street, there's a hotel, a building, a chapel, and it's academic. Um, the location here, England, Oxfordshire, Oxford Broad Street, Balliol College, Trinity College. Uh, the date we put it up back in 2014. And in this case, we don't know the photographer, so the credit is unknown. And the holder, uh, the people that own it are Harris Manchester College. And you would go to the library at Harris Manchester College if you wanted to see the actual image, the lantern slide. And they have a more information tab here. And basically this tab tells you the same thing I said in the lecture about how we dated this slide. So, do we have, are any of the other questions related to the database directly, how it works? Uh, not that I can see. So, so just going back to that original question about um, where the the dating of the images is if you have an absolute date if you know from your records the absolute date that the photo was taken where where would you find that if for instance um the example i gave earlier after the 8th 1908 that was actually written on the on the label on the slide uh in this case we know the date of this one because we actually sat down looked at what was in the background and dated it so we have a range, and that's the information that's on the more information tab. So all, all of that would always be in the more information section? Yeah. If it's not right in the caption, it'll be, there'll be a more information tab discussing the dating. Excellent. Uh, we've had another question. About the Tudor fascia. That's the one. Can you see that, Dane? Can you read that one out? So someone was fascinated to find out that the building in Core Market um, was not a Tudor building. So we're talking about pret a manger I think. Yeah. Uh, do we do we know why they put a Tudor fascia onto the building and when they might have done that? Well, we, we know the when part um, was certainly modern. Uh, we know it was done in, 1980, in the 1980s when that building was reworked. Um, that's not an issue. I'm looking to, to find that one here. Ah, 
that one that in particular image of the re rework only exists in my um, <coughs> my presentation this is a, is what the building looks like now uh, this is the corner of ship street and uh, corn market and we know that that part of that building is actually uh, housing. So the college just decided to redo it. And just like the people in the 19th century decided to do uh, trendy, modern, flashy storefronts, their dis this dis particular decision was to, to make it look more historic. There are probably, um, because it's a listed building, there's probably less latitude in the modern world for what you can do it. And I'm sure that had probably had some effect on the, on the architectural choice. That is fascinating. I had always assumed it was a Tudor building. So uh, well, it, I is, it is a Tudor building, mm -hmm. the, you know, the inside of that structure, but generation after generation of merchants had updated the front of the shops to make it to bring customers in and then it's been turned back to what people perceive to be traditional tudor yeah and and what's interesting is the the drawing i showed you um from 1799 that shows that even then the tudor style had fallen out of fashion and was had been covered up that's really interesting it looks as if we're getting close to our allotted time now. So unless anyone else has any further questions, I'm just checking. I don't see any new questions. Um, all it leaves for me to do is to thank you, Janice, for your time and your incredible collection of images. Um, it has been a really fascinating evening. And I, for one, am certainly going to go and have a browse around the AIR website now. Yeah, um, you, and you also, if you didn't get a chance to type down the, or jot down the URL, go to Google or your favorite search engine and type in air project and you, you will find ultimately us and, and come and see us. Yeah. So just a reminder that that's spelt H E I R. Yep. Um, so one more word from us at the festival um, is to thank you all for coming. Uh, to remind you that we are an independent charity and we do rely on your donations to help us make next year's festival even better than this year's. Um, you will receive an email following uh, this session um, asking for your feedback. So there'll be a little form for you to let us know what you thought of the session and also with a link to our donation page on our website. Um, but from me, it's thank you. Jane, did you have any last things to say? There's some great questions. Thanks for coming. It's been a good first, first day of the festival. There are 30 more, so we're hoping to see, see some more of you uh, virtually over the next few weeks.